Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Najiba Saeed, and uh, as Imam Asim already shared with you, my professional, my professional uh, title, I also have been doing for the last 20 years peacemaking work between people in the Muslim tradition and people across different traditions, and in cases of violence around the world. So today I wanted to share with you 10 principles of Muslim healing justice. So why are we using this word healing justice? Because one of the things that I really think is a beautiful intervention that the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the stories of the prophets from the Qur'an give us is a notion that when Muslims come to justice, we don't come merely to fight for justice, but we come as healers. We come as healers who bring with us the capacity to move not just to get what you want in your community or what you want as a person, but we bring with us a spirituality and an ethics to heal the world as we do our work. Because there are ways to go and look for justice and fight for justice where you end up doing exactly what you are fighting against. So the Muslim spiritual ethic says, in fact, the goal of our work for justice is to heal ourselves in the process and to make sure that the world is left in a state of rahma, of mercy and kindness, and in fact, compassion. So that's why I wanted to kind of bring this to you today is a lot of times we talk about justice so abstractly. What as a Muslim do we bring to this struggle? And how do we elevate the work, the discourse, the conversation, and the activism? So I have 10 principles of Muslim models of healing justice. So the first part of the first principle within the Muslim tradition is that for us, justice and mercy are intertwined. That rahma, rahama, that comes from the same word for the word womb, and justice and adil are intertwined. One cannot be just and be cruel. One cannot be a tyrant and be just. Allah tells us that His own mercy is far greater than His wrath. So Allah, our God, our God is a God of deep compassion and mercy, far more than retribution. Our God, Allah, is not one who comes and tells us that the only thing that is given is punishment. That you were only sought after to, to be punished for what you did. But in fact, our God is one whose mercy, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, is an infinite well of compassion. So the nature of God himself, of God in Islam, is one of a compassionate God. And we have to remind ourselves of this because in this time when our tradition is being demonized, the God that we are being told we worship is not the God we actually worship. The God that others in other places demonize the God we worship, Allah, the true and one God, then we have to remind ourselves, in fact, the way Allah describes in 99 characteristics, in 99 attributes, is one of incredible and encompassing compassion. Remind yourself of that. And in fact, the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a Prophet Muhammad, was described as rahma, as mercy, as compassion to who? To all peoples, to all those who are, were with him at that time and, and in all time. Not just to you and me as Muslims, but to everyone. So this is a profound message that one of the things that we do as Muslims in healing justice is to be agents of compassion so that we don't need to have even justice sought against us. If we are working in ways to embody compassion, society itself becomes a healing place. The mosque becomes a healing institution. The family, the Muslim family becomes a place of healing and not just for themselves, but for all of the community that surrounds them. So that's the first principle in a Muslim vision of healing justice. It's that our justice and mercy are intertwined in our tradition. The second is that we recalibrate strength. 
We live in a time where strength is measured by your capacity to physically harm another nation or another person. What did Rasulullah tell us? He said, actually, strength is not to win domination over your opponent, but to withhold your anger. So we live in a time where we say strength is not carrying weapons around. We live in a time where that is being questioned and we say as Muslims, actually, your strength is not in imposing harm, but your strength is in your capacity to have compassion, to withhold your anger. We live in a time where unleashed anger against targeted communities has created so much harm. And in fact, as a Muslim, our strength is not in our capacity to hurt others, but in our capacity to heal others. And that is not how many societies define strength. That is not how our media defines strength. That's not how entertainment defines strength. That's not how video games define strength. Our capacity for strength is in our ability to demonstrate compassion. The third is that this compassion this idea of justice is not limited to just your own race. It's not limited just to your own gender. The Prophet's last sermon, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his last, his last sermon, his last address to the people, to his people was an anti-racist sermon, saying that part of what he saw in the future and what was happening even in his time was discrimination based on color, discrimination based on national identity, discrimination based on where you came from. And we know in his final words that in fact he told us there is no difference between us based on our race, based on our ethnicity. So he in fact was not someone who just looked for justice but named an anti-racist agenda. Islam is an anti-racist religion. We stand against racism. Do you know what he also did in his final khutbah and final words was to remember the rights of women. So not only is justice not just for those that are not of the same, we don't seek justice just for those who look like us, but it's also to seek it for those that are both men and women. The other thing that's beautiful, so we have the first three principles. The fourth principle is that justice is not limited just to adults. Rasulullah sallallahu says in a hadith, fear Allah and be just to children, both the young and the old amongst them. A summary of one of his hadith. So it's not that you attain a certain level and suddenly we start thinking about whether or not we should pursue justice. So if you think about it right now, Nelson Mandela actually tells us the measure of a society is by how they treat their children. So if we live in a time when young children have to call for gun control against their own lives, what does that say about our society? And by this I mean, are our children safe? Are our children fed well? Do our children have shelter? These are all the things that children, as part of their rights upon us as a society, as Muslims, we think about. So it's important that we think about justice, not just related to those that are seniors, that are older, but also to those. And why is it important? Why did Rasulullah point out children? Because they are the ones who often do not have power in a society. They are the ones who cannot speak for themselves. They are the ones who are so unable because of, the, because, of their, um, because of their age at times, they are the ones who are often in wars the most brutalized. So I want us to remember that it's justice and Islam brings again this beautiful model of healing saying an anti-racist message, a message inclusive of gender, and then a message that says children are also to receive justice. And you know what's beautiful about that hadith is it says, fear Allah. Because one of the things that that hadith recognizes is that part of our piety is to be just to children. It's easy to be unjust. And in fact, to do justice when you don't have to, when the person for whom you are doing justice has no power, that is actually the test. When we speak for those who 
who are not able to be at the table. And one of the beautiful things that we're seeing, and, and we saw also at the time of Rasulullah is that children and teenagers, in fact, do have a voice and have always been at the table. Many of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah were very young and were a part of the community and integrated into it. So number five, one of the things we learn about a healing justice model from the Muslim community is that you have a right. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. And often in what we call retributive justice, people are focused just on my right. Give this to me. I didn't get that. One of the beautiful things about a Muslim ethic of justice is it comes with a mutual duty of performance. That I have a right on you and you have a right on me. And in fact, we talk about this form of rights, human beings, the rights we have on each other. So not only do I have a right, but I have a responsibility. So if I am asking for you to fulfill a transactional right in justice, I too have to raise myself to the level of what I'm asking you to do. It's not that I seek justice and I may act unjust, or that I don't have a duty of honesty. This is a beautiful, um, a beautiful part of the healing justice model. It's a model of mutuality, that my dignity is intertwined with your dignity. If your dignity is blemished, then my dignity is blemished, because in fact, we are in many ways one. So for instance, when a Muslim performs an act of injustice, they cannot merely ask Allah, Ya Allah, forgive me. What must they do? Does anyone know? Yes. They ask the person whom they did injustice. Exactly. They have to go to the person to whom they were unjust and ask not just for forgiveness, but what can I do to make it better? How can I make this better for you? And that, in fact, was one of the earliest forms of what is now very popular called restorative justice. That it's not just revenge or retribution, but it's going and asking and saying, I have done something unjust, and you also must ask Allah for forgiveness. But if you ask the divine for forgiveness and say, I rely on, I, I rely on my religion to give me an excuse not to deal with other human beings. The Muslim model of justice says, no, you cannot do that. You must go to the human being to whom you are unjust. So our justice, our healing justice is relational. It's based on being in relationship with other people. We cannot use, and in fact, religion across history and time has been used to perpetrate injustice because guess what? The forgiveness in some, in some uh, religious articulations, seek justice from God, it doesn't matter what you do to other people. In fact, this Muslim intervention says no. Justice is tied to your behavior to other human beings. God will not show mercy, in other hadith, God does not show mercy to those who do not show mercy to others. So if you're seeking God's mercy, Prophet Muhammad tells us, and you have been unmerciful to others and a tyrant to others, your relationship with people here on earth is actually connected to your relationship with God. So your spiritual relationship with God is connected to your injustice or your justice with other human beings on earth. We can't, in fact, live an isolated spiritual life as Muslims. Justice is manifested by our relationship with other human beings and aided by the religion and mercy that God gives us all, inshallah. The other beautiful thing, since this is one of my areas of study, is this notion of procedural justice. So sometimes we think about the outcome. Did I get what I wanted out of that situation? In fact, there are a lot of studies on what we call procedural justice. How is justice done? Is the process itself unjust? So you look at the procedures. Are the procedures transparent? Are the procedures racist? Are the procedures open? Are the procedures clear? And it's beautiful because we have an example of procedural justice, which is tied to healing justice, because if the carrying out of a justice process is harmful, then it becomes unjust itself. The means by which we seek justice have to themselves reflect principles of justice. 
So the women came to Rasulullah and Prophet Muhammad at his time and they said, We don't feel we have we're not getting enough we're not getting enough interaction. So what did he do? What did he do? Does anyone know? This is a classic example of procedural justice, of inclusion in the process. Does anyone know what he did? He reserved a day just to listen to their issues. Wow. So this is profound. Because what happened, again, the people who were coming were not the people with the most power in the community. It wasn't the millionaires, uh, I guess at that time it was how many camels you owned. <laughs> um, uh, since, since uh, you know, it wasn't those that had the most money, the most power. But when people came who said, we feel excluded, not in the outcome, but we feel excluded, excluded in the process, he remedied that. So pay attention. If you are in a position of authority, pay attention not just to the outcome of justice, but the procedure of justice. If the procedure of justice is, sh is throwing people out, is pushing people aside based on race, based on gender, national origin, then that means, in fact, the justice system itself is harmful. And that's why the Muslim sense of healing justice says, whatever the justice system is, whether it's in my community setting, whether it's in my national setting, it needs to be itself reflective of a strong procedure that is inclusive, transparent, and open. So number seven. A healing justice is not ju just is not limited just to Muslims. So there's the famous hadith uh, when someone came to Rasulullah to Prophet Muhammad, saying of the Prophet, asking, "What is <coughs> what is the most excellent excellent exertion?" Or the idea of jihad, as we know in our community and tradition, it means exertion. What is the best exertion? And Prophet Muhammad said to speak a word of truth in front of a tyrant or a, someone who is a tyrannical leader. Does Rasulullah say, oh, and if the leader is Muslim, you shouldn't speak? Or does Rasulullah say, only if the leader is unjust to Muslims should you speak? No. There are no qualifications in that hadith. So it means to stand for justice means that I stand when my brothers and sisters of other traditions, not just within the Muslim community, as we talked about the anti-racist message of our tradition, but also when others are experiencing injustice. injustice. Because one of the things about a healing justice is it's not a selfish justice. It's a selfless justice. It's a justice that says, I am here to stand today let's say on an issue of homelessness. And I don't just stand there for the rights of housing for the Muslim community. And not only do I stand, but I aid others and I help others. So and it also means when people from our tradition are violating the rights of others, we sometimes have to stand against our own, right? This is what the Hadith is telling us too. It's not a favoritism just for Muslims. And that's why if we actually thought of this healing justice, it's a process that brings healing not just for me, not just for my community, but it brings it as Rasulullah's mission was, you become known as the person who brings compassion for everyone. And it be brings you an authenticity that moves beyond the transactional notion of justice. There's another beautiful uh, head principle that I wanted to point out. It's when possible, we lean to peace. So the Quran tells us this again and again, that when they lean to peace, you lean to peace. And this is actually a strategic decision and a strategic way to think about justice and a healing way. When you have a capacity to choose a method that is more healing than harmful, then that is the way and the direction that we move in. And when you get into power, how you choose to embody justice is profoundly important. Because sometimes we pursue justice, we achieve it, and then we do exactly the same thing that was done to us. Does that sound familiar to people? And here I don't mean just in 
formal positions of power, but even in the way we run our community organizations. So it's really important to think about what Rasulullah did when he came back to Mecca with so much power at that moment. After years of suffering, what was the position? What did he do with those who were in Mecca? What could he have done? Forgive everybody. What's that? Forgive everybody. He forgave, he gave asylum. So when you come into a position of power, you have a choice, as Rasulullah did, to seek retribution, to seek revenge, or you seek a healing justice. A justice that says, now that I have achieved the aims and the goals and there is equality, let that equality be shared by everybody. That's a profound lesson from 1400 years ago. So all of us, sometimes we need to remember that we do achieve wins, we do come to power, and when we have that capacity, how do we exert it? Is it an inclusive justice or is it an exclusive justice? Or is it a chance to say, I have power now for retribution to do to those what has been done to me? Keep in mind, we have the right to ask for justice and compensation, and that is very much within, um, and I'm going to, to go towards that. My point was here, when you have the position of power, when you have the capacity to exert power, how are you different or similar to those that took power away from you? It's a question we ask, it's a healing justice question. One of the beautiful things, the metaphor for justice, this is uh, point nine that I wanted to make, was balance. The Qur'an tells us this mizan, this balance. Do not, in Surah the rahman do not transgress the balance. So this is incredibly beautiful because it gives us a metaphor, it gives us an idea of what justice looks like. Justice is a balance. And that when I take from others, you know, what's interesting is it would be that when I take from others, I'm actually taking from myself. Because to be a Muslim who is pious means that I don't seek to transgress the balance of justice. That balance and equality and equity are important. Not just equality, but equity. So when I am transgressing the balance, our piety becomes undermined. That's why when Allah calls us to justice again and again, you see, fear Allah. Be mindful of Allah. Because when you are not mindful of Allah, that is when that internal, we had a lecture a couple of months ago, I think, when I was talking about the liberation of the self, when the self takes over. So it's very important that we understand this balance of justice is a metaphor that makes us think through that part of being a Muslim of high status of spirituality is that we exhibit the balance of justice. And that when the balance is too heavy on one side, whether that is heavy in my domain or on someone else's, that I seek to balance it, right? So it's not just that I don't try to make the imbalance, but if I see the imbalance, and whether the imbalance has me or someone else involved, that I am someone who is a seeker and a producer and someone who acts to restore the balance of justice for all peoples. Last of all, this has to be a little bit dramatic, so I'll drink some water. It's not dramatic, I'm just thirsty. <laughs> Last of all, we've talked about people. Guess who else has a right of us on justice? The earth herself animals themselves. The Quran tells us that animals have ummas like we do. Animals have societies of organization. That's why the Quran says, look at the bee, look at the ant. And the Quran tells us also in Surah Zaza that the earth is going to be called on the day of judgment as a witness against our transgressions on her that the earth will be called as a witness against human beings for what we have done. This is incredible because what it says is that justice, so when and if, as you see in the rules of just war in the Muslim tradition, crops were not to be burned, the earth was not to be hurt, 
So part of our justice is really based on this notion of interdependence. That Allah, all of Allah's creation has an element that is sacred to it. So that I don't unjustly seek to take from the earth more than I need. Even if you're making wudu, when you make wudu, are you supposed to use more water than you need? Do we just lavish water and throw it around? No, even in the act of wudu. And I think this is a very important part of healing justice from the Muslim tradition because it says the environment and everything that is affected by our decisions. It's not merely my decision. If I make a decision, it has to include the justice of the earth herself. The Quran tells us also, you know, even how we walk on the earth, how are we supposed to walk? Does anyone remember from Surah Luqman and other surahs? Huh? Humility. With humility, but how do you literally walk on the earth? How is justice is embodied in our tradition? How do we walk on the earth? Not heavy footed. Even as we walk, we are to be light in our gait, to be we don't walk as people, not just with pride, but to stomp and to, to injure the earth even in our walking. There's something so beautiful about this intervention because what it says is also the resources of the earth are resources that need to be shared. They are resources that cannot be monopolized by one group. They are resources that are not there infinitely. They are resources that have to be taken care of together. So I think this is really beautiful because I thought about it. What will the earth say about us on the day of judgment? Were we careful about the water of her, of her earth? Did we pollute her rivers? Did we pollute her streams? Did we, what have we done to this earth and what will she say on the day of judgment? So think, think about these things. Um, and I think, you know, I just wanted to kind of reiterate the 10, the 10 principles of healing justice. The first is that justice and mercy are intertwined. The second is that there is strength in compassion, not in domination and capacity to hurt one another. That justice is not limited and the seeking of justice to people of your own race your, and your own gender. That this is an anti-racist tradition. That justice is to be sought for those who are children and when children give voice to their concerns, this is a community that listens. That right comes with a mutual duty and obligation of responsibility. So it's not that we just seek justice, but we must also have a duty of performing justice. That our relationships with other human beings must be based on justice because we know if we don't show mercy to each other, we risk losing the mercy of Allah. That our healing justice model is procedural. It looks at how we actually build a justice system. Is that justice system inclusive or exclusive? That what we seek for justice is not limited just to people of our tradition, but in fact, justice is something that we pursue for all peoples. When possible, we lean towards an inclusive practice of peace and forgiveness, even as we seek what is due to us in our justice system. That the metaphor for justice in our tradition is balance. Therefore, we seek to be those that exhibit a balance in our behavior of being equitable to all people. But when we see an injustice, an imbalance, whether that imbalance is in our favor or against our favor or in the favor or against the favor of another, we seek to bring balance to it through our actions and through social justice. And last of all, that even the earth herself and our environment, the air, all of these creations of Allah, we are here after all on this earth as a vicegerent, as a representative of the, of the divine. So therefore, we must be very mindful of how we utilize and how we share and how we respect the resources of all creation. Shukran jazakumullah. I think my time is up now. Thank you.